My name is Konstantin Budnik. I'm working for EPAM Systems. I'm chief technologist for Big Data. And uh, um, I'll try not to bore you to death, and I try to be short and, you know, quick and, and hopefully funny. So maybe you can vote for me later on. Anyway, um, I, I got up this morning and I thought, like, you know what? I'm lucky. It's a great morning. And, and, and the reason it's great, the reason it's, you know, my, my life is, is sort of bright is because I live to the day where Java developers are finally treated like the rock stars, right? I mean, look at the stage, look at this setup. In my life, in 20 years I've been doing the software development, I've never seen something like that, right? So I feel like Mick Jagger pretty much, right? So like all jittery and hyped up. And I don't need a Coke for that. So, um, and you know what, I'll, I'll talk about the whole line of the years and then two decades actually that precluded this very, very moment today that get us all together. And I will talk a little bit about the, 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 the history as I saw it, uh, the history of the Java development, the ecosystem development, the, the number of the great verticals that Java sprung to life, right? So, and you know, that's my view. Might be inaccurate, um, but you know, you don't have to like it. Anyway, so it all started back in uh, 1999, right? And uh, there was an oak, which uh, supposedly uh, was called after the oak tree that was sitting um, in front of the window of the James uh, Gosling office at Sun Microsystems. Um, I guess, you know, engineers are not creative when it gets to, to funny names or, or beautiful graphic, right? So they, <laughs> they're good at writing code and doing the, 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 the system integration. But yeah, Oak is a boring name. But nonetheless, um, a, later bit, a little bit later it got renamed into Java. And I guess between 1991 and uh, 95, Gosling and his team were drinking a lot of coffee. That's probably why, you know, they, they decided to call it Java. Um, and actually, Probably until 1997, which is 20 years ago, pretty much today, um, when the Java was submitted for the standardization, uh, uh, language standardization uh, uh, query, um, we, we didn't hear much about the Java, right? So, and then from 97, 96, 97, 98, the uh, uh, world started sort of waking up to the, to the notion of, of Java language, right? And I got into, into this great revolution actually right about this point, so which, uh, which was sort of exciting. There wasn't any tools. My first, my first environment was, was Emacs, right? So um, you can imagine how, how fun it was, right? So, and then IntelliJ IDEA came in like whatever, 50 years later. So, um, and it, you know, the people were developing the stuff and then writing the code and doing a lot of things and trying to uh, have the, the, the smart coffee makers. I remember actually on the first Java one, I was telling the story yesterday uh, when somebody do, were making the, the coffee for me. So on the first Java one, uh, Gosling and then his guys, they, have, they had a uh, uh, little, little coffee maker. Well, actually, I, I'll take it back. They had the Jet, jet Ink printer loaded with liquid caramel and they programmed that so you can actually put the cup with the coffee under the, the jets and it would paint the, the uh, logo of the Java, you know, the steaming cup of the Java using the, this caramel. So it was actually pretty cool. Um, and that, that's what we were doing actually up to whatever, 2005, I guess, right? 2005? No, it's wrong. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the date is wrong. It's, a 2000, it, it's 1999 actually, right? So it should be 1999. I, I, I'm sorry about that. So Genie came out, and Genie was, <clears throat> as, as you know, some of you might, might know about this, it was actually pretty much the first distributed service discovery and lookup mechanism, right? So you could actually build great dis distributed systems using G Genie and, and, and uh, you know, run the services around the, the, the cluster of the machines and dynamically pop the, the services here and there. And, and it was cool stuff, actually, right? So the guy who, who was behind this whole Genie project uh, was a Bill Joy, uh, one of the founders of the Sun Microsystems. Actually, accidentally, Sun Microsystems would, would be mentioned quite a bit of, quite a, bit of num quite, quite a number of the times today, right? Because Sun was so instrumental. Sun, Sun was so revolutionary in this, in this whole thing. So in 1999, Genie came out. And uh, what happened later, 
Come on. And then 2000 happened, right? So you remember that. So people were literally opening up a bunch of the credit cards. They were taking the bank loans. They were hoping that on the January 1st, 2000, everything in the computer world would get nulled and they would you know, end up with a bunch of money and nobody would actually come after them, right? So that was like, okay, end of the world, right? So it didn't happen. So uh, what happened though around 2000 is that Sun Microsystems had developed this, this great distributed task framework thingy, right? So I mentioned Genie because Genie was the, the, the core foundation of it. And distributed task framework <clears throat> was effectively, I would say, pretty much what, what you would see in, in data processing, processing systems today, right? So it was ma massively distributed environment where you could describe the workload, where you could shuffle the data around and process it any way you want to, right? So it was sort of, sort of nice and cool. Um, 2004, 2003, Groovy, right? So one of the first JVM-based languages and, and in my opinion, one of the best and actually, Somebody was talking here, oh, Eugene was talking here uh, about the JavaScript and you know how, how JavaScript is bad and stuff like that. I think Groovy should be called JavaScript. It, it's, it's more JavaScript than JavaScript would ever be, I think, right? So this, <laughs> that's, that's cool. It's functional. This is easy to write. It doesn't require boilerplate code. You know, it, it's super fast for develop stuff. I love it. So uh, Scala, not so much. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this anymore. So. Um, and then uh, 2005, in 2005, by that time, Java was so popular that everyone and every single large software development corporation wanted a piece of it, right? So Intel wanted to get on the train, IBM wanted to be on it, Oracle sort of wanted to be on it, Microsoft, you know, with illegal practices and all, wanted to be on it. Uh, but it was hard because, you know, people who were doing this, this Java kind of development uh, at Sun, they, they, they were smart son of a bitches, right? So what they did is that they said, okay, so Java is free, but in order to write your own Java, you have to qualify with our TCK, which is tool, uh, test compatibility kit or whatever it is, technology compatibility kit, right? Which was, uh, interestingly enough, developed up in uh, Novosibirsk in Russia at the, at the Sun campus. So, and uh, they, they did not give TCK away, right? So TCK was proprietary, TCK was sold for the money, and if you wanted to be called Java, you had to pass this, right? And clearly, <coughs> passing, passing this, this compliance test was actually not an easy task, so it was test for the compatibility at the language level, compiler level, runtime, and, and so on and so far. And actually, Microsoft paid dearly for not, for not sticking to the, to the compliance with, with, with these requirements. But nonetheless, so in 2005, unlike Microsoft, IBM and, and Intel got together and said, you know what, we're going to fight you, son, but we're going to fight you square and fair, and we're going to launch this open source project um, under Apache, Apache license, right? So we're going to fight you in the open, and we'll see who's, who's going to win. So um, the project has been submitted to Apache Foundation and got into the top level project around 2005, May 2005, and it was actually, you know, nicely developed and stuff like this. Interesting war story, though, at the end of 2004, Intel came to Russia, uh, to Moscow particularly, and St. Petersburg, and they literally bought 70 or 80 people, I don't remember, literally bought them, like, everything, including the, 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 the cause that the people were wearing at the time, and, and, and asked them to work on the Java project, right? So, effectively, a bunch of the Sun engineers has been paid for to abandon everything they were doing and move to Intel and start working on this project, right? And, and, and I remember I had to actually fly from California in the midst of 2005, February 2005, in order to start hiring people for the team that just, you know, were gone completely the week before, right? So it was a lot of fun and cold, by the way. So um, anyway, the Harmony has been started and was relatively successful until actually, in 2006, Sun delivered a completely terminal blow to this whole effort by opening Java under JPL version 3 license, right? And said like, okay, you want to fight us in the open? Here we go. Here's the source code. Every can, everyone, can uh, everyone can contribute. Everyone can advance the platform. By the way, this is a wireless license, so if you do contribute to our source code, 
or so oh, source base, you will have to actually get the changes back into the upstream. So basically, you cannot advance the platform somewhere inside of your offices proprietarily and then fight us back uh, because you would have better feature or whatever it is. You will have to actually contribute it back for the, for the sake and the, and the better, betterment of the community. So it's a very similar to Linux kernel, except that GPL version 2 is actually doesn't force you in some cases to contribute your, your changes back, right? So if you do non-derivative work around the kernel, you don't have to contribute the code back. If you change the kernel, for instance, then you have to, right? GPL version 3 doesn't make this distinction, so whatever you touch, you have to. That's why it's called viral, right? And, and clearly, it was actually very, very hard to, to fight because by 2006, uh, Java was effectively 10 years in development. It was a rich platform. It was widely, pretty much universally accepted in the industry. And the Apache Harmony was just coming up. And you know, Apache Harmony, actually, by the way, never was able to pass the TCK test. So there were a couple of tests that they, they, they could, not, could not pass effectively. Anyway, and uh, oh, going back a little bit, Except uh, besides of the going into open source around 2006, uh, around 2005, Linux Foundation has been formed. And in 2006, we brought the Java into the Linux standard base, which was the initiative of the Linux Foundation to effectively standardize the Linux distributions all across, right? So today, no matter where you go to Ubuntu or you go to um, uh, Red Hat or whatever, um, you would expect to see a certain functionality, a certain set of the services in the Linux distribution that would be the same across, across the distros. Back in 2006, 2005, it wasn't the case. Even back to 2009, it wasn't the case yet, but it's better now. So that said, from 2006, I would say Java development sort of lost the excitement a little bit, right? So the Java was moving forward. Everything was kind of OK. EGB was, was going around, or EGB was going around. All these kind of attempts to standardize you know, the, the, the business logic and SOAP stuff, and don't get me started. Anyway, so but um, now we're getting into verticals. Right. And verticals are actually way more exciting, in my opinion, than the Java itself. So around 2007, um, a couple of the people, one from Armenia, another one from St. Petersburg, started the company called GridGain in, in Silicon Valley. And the GridGain was probably one of the first in-memory data grids uh, invented. Right? So, and, and we'll talk about the in-memory data grids because, in my opinion, it is just a fascinating concept that, that makes everything much more simpler and, and faster. But anyway, so they started it around 2008, 2007 probably. And uh, a little bit later, they, they got into Apache again. So this is not the grid gain logo. This is Apache Ignite logo that, that hasn't been made until probably 2015 or something like that when we brought the grid gain into Apache. But nonetheless, so that was probably the first, the first piece. And, and it's quite, quite, quite important. I put it on, on, the, on, the, on the timeline for a reason. So, and then 2007, September, Hadoop, right? So it wasn't probably even called Hadoop back then, I guess. And this logo wasn't the Hadoop logo. The, the, the real Hadoop, this little stuffed toy that uh, dogs, cat, and kids were, were lo loving and, and, and playing with was actually sickening and, and literally like looked like it was ill for, for 50 years, right? So this, this nice, healthy animal is, is not what the Hadoop used to be. Um, the, reason, the reason this first version of Hadoop is, is quite important is that it got into the Apache around this time. And, and people started using it in order to process the large amount of data on the commodity hardware, right? So you could put together a bunch of the cheap, or sort of cheap, Linux, uh, Linux based clusters, right? So run this Java platform on it, and all of a sudden you could process the huge amounts of data in, in a way shorter time and way cheaper than you know, other, other solutions would allow you to. So, and then, of course, 2009, 2010, 2011, a bunch of different technologies started popping up. So, uh, this little squirrel is called Apache Flink. This is the first probably ever streaming. 
stream processing implementation that came uh, from the from the University of Berlin, and uh, again later on it came to the Apache, and I'm 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 talking about Apache a lot because the organizers when they they they, they said do you want to do the, the talk at the conference? I said, yeah, sure, but let me do the talk about the open source. They said, nah, you know, we have enough of the high quality content, your stuff doesn't cut it. So I said, okay, I'll do something else, <laughs> but I'll be talking about open source anyway. <laughs> so, um, and then 2011, this little circus up there, that's Apache Big Top. So Apache Big Top was, was and is actually the framework that has been made with the noble idea of taming this whole kind of bunch of animals that, that were roaming around in the, in the Hadoop ecosystem, right? So just like how many of you are using Linux here? Whoa! Good, me too. So, <laughs> but uh, the cool part is that if you, if you imagine how hard is that to actually build the, the working successful Linux distribution, right? So many moving parts, bunch of the libraries, bunch of the versions, you have to get them together, you have guaranteed that all the APIs are, you know, laid against each other properly, right? So you don't have the breakages, you don't have the backward incompatibilities, and so on and so forth. It's, it's like a lot, of, a lot of work, right? Hadoop ecosystem back in 2011, even now it's not as complex, but still, if you look at the modern Hadoop distribution, Apache Hadoop distribution, commercial or otherwise, you would see that there is about 40 large components, right? These large components has a bunch of the de de dependencies, and you know, you are Java developers. You worked with Ant, you worked with Maven. You know how ugly and hairy Java dependencies could be, especially when you bring two different components from two different places, and they depend on the same on the same library but different versions of the library. And these different versions are not necessarily even work with each other because the APIs are all screwed up, right? And all of a sudden, you have this transient dependency mess that you don't know how to solve, right? So that's what Apache Big Top was effectively uh, created for. <clears throat> it was like a, a Debian of the, of the Hadoop world, in a sense, right? And still is. And actually, it turns out to be quite successful. Today, every single commercial and open, free distribution of Apache Hadoop is actually made using this. So Google, Google Data Proc is actually built on top of uh, Apache Big Top, and I'm particularly proud of it because I was one of the co-authors of this, of this project. Amazon EMR actually built on top of it. Uh, Azure HD Insight is built on top of it. Cloudera, Hortonworks, every single one of them are built on top of it. Anyway, so um, 2011. The first, finally, 1.0 Hadoop version, right? So that was a, a huge, actually, milestone, and, and the community around the Hadoop said, you know what, we're confident today we do have this stable version of the Hadoop. We can give it to you. You can do stuff with it. We have stabilized and finalized a bunch of the APIs. You can write the code against it. You can start building the ecosystem because literally, there were a number of the uh, different components around this uh, by, by 2011. Hive was there that, that Facebook has contributed back to the open source. Apache Kafka, these little circles in there, um, popped up in around 2010, I believe, something like that, from Twitter. Um, HBase was around this, of course. But, but the problem was that the, the APIs, the, the, the functionality of the Hadoop was actually moving forward. The, the file system has been still in the evolving kind of sta stage, right? So the map reduce was changing and so on and so far. And in fact, actually, Hadoop 1 had two different versions of the map reduce, the old map reduce and the new map reduce. And there is an interesting uh, infographics I, I did back in the day where I sort of mapped out the, the Hadoop versions before Hadoop 1.0, and it was Hadoop 14, then it was Hadoop 18 and 20, and then there was Hadoop 22, which wasn't exactly compatible with Hadoop 20, and there was Hadoop 23, which was way better than Hadoop 22, but wasn't exactly compatible with 22, and then there was Hadoop 1.0 based off 23, which wasn't exactly compatible with 23. So anyway, so you, you just imagine if you're the application developer in the downstream, right? So try to, to do something against it, right? So it was crazy. But anyway, so Hadoop 1.0 came out, Okay, so got got finalized, got got more or less stabilized, and it was cool. <sighs> but the next year, or the the end of the year, a few months later, Apache Harmony finally died, right? Because Java 
under even un, even under the, the viral GPL license, Java was so popular, so effective, so non-stoppable that this corporate sponsored Apache project has actually just died, right? So people started walking away from it. And effectively, by the end of 2011, they couldn't find enough people to vote for the releases, not to mention, actually, there weren't any releases anymore. So Apache pulled the plug on this and said, like, you know what? Kill it. So they moved it into the Apache Etic, which is special kind of graveyard of the of the projects in, in Apache Foundation, right? So they become redundant and they sit in there forever. So, but it was gone. So Java won. I mean, like, literally Java won everything, right? So there was nothing else but Java. I think it's, it's, it's amazing, amazing time. Um, and then 2012, <coughs> Hadoop ecosystem was moving forward and people do understand that, you know what? MapReduce actually blows. Okay, map reuse doesn't cut it. Map reuse is slow, it's horrible, it's, 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 it's a lot of the resources. We need to do something with that. And, and this bunch of the bright kids from Berkeley, they started doing this project called Spark. And the reason I actually mentioned Scala there, despite of my dislike to it, is that it has been written in, in, in Scala, right? So and it, it's effectively, Apache Spark is map reduce 2.0, right? So, is, is here anyone who is using big data projects at all? Apache Spark, something like that. Hadoop, no? Anyone? Well, okay, so four people, fine. Could have been worse. So <laughs> at least they're still listening. <laughs> so, but anyway, and the Spark was actually pretty cool, right? So it improved the memory model and it improved the, uh, the, the persistence model of the, of the map reduce. And, and literally, people were happy because now you could have process the same amount of data probably like 10, 10, 10, 15 times faster, right? So it was cool. And, and Scala is actually is quite compact language, so it's easy to write application and it was not. So. But um, uh, it, it didn't took another seven years to get from Hadoop 1.0 to Hadoop 2.0, so Hadoop 2.0 came about. And it was completely incompatible with Hadoop 1.0, right? So it was another crazy leap, but we had to do this because a lot of things got changed, the MapReduce interfaces got changed again, HDFS got you know, advanced a lot, um, high availability was added into the name node, so you could have you know, moved the, the central node elsewhere if the first one died and stuff like that. So and it was sort of a milestone. Um, and then a bunch of things were happening after that, and we came to today, right? So, and let's, uh, let's enjoy the fact that today, with all the advancements, and probably big data ecosystem helped a little bit in order to get us to the mark of 10 million or close to 10 million Java developers in the world today. Because if you look in our practice at EPAM, at the, the big data practice, the people who are we hiring to, to be the big data engineers, right, the architects and so on and so forth, the first and major requirement is you have to be a Java programmer. You have to understand concurrency. You have to be able to write distributed code. You have to be smart, right? Otherwise, you can go and do JavaScript, right? So I, I'm not bashing JavaScript, by the way. It's pretty cool language. So <laughs> anyway, so just a just couple of more war, sto war, war stories, and, and you know, I have 20 minutes. I need to run fast now. So um, 2011, technology was goddamn hot, actually, right? So literally hot. So I was working at Yahoo by the time, and this is the picture of the actual Yahoo cluster. We called it Kryptonite. It had 4,000 nodes. It holded whatever, 16, 14 petabytes of data, right? So there was a bunch of the jobs running every single day on it, like hundreds and hundreds of the actual jobs serving the Yahoo portal. And Yahoo, by the, by the time, had about 600 million unique hits a day from around the world, right? So it was the biggest internet portal ever, I guess, right? So too bad it's actually gone now. Microsoft helped them as well. Um, so interestingly enough, despite of the running bunch of the jobs on the cluster, the utilization of the cluster, again, because of the map reduce, because of the resource scheduler in there, was sort of low, right? So it was under 40% or something like that, right? And I remember the, the, the guy who was in charge of the Hadoop department, he said, like, you know what? I don't care. The, the, the bosses are, like, literally kicking me in the butt for having so many expensive hardware racks staying there and doing nothing and just wasting electricity. Just you know, bump up the, the utilization somehow. And people semi-jokingly, but I guess it wasn't all, you know, jokes, 
they were considering to run MapReduce sleep jobs just to, you know, to, to occupy the resources a little bit, to, to show like 80% utilization. Doing nothing still, but you know, the, the numbers would be better. Well, they never did it, but you know, the consideration was there for sure. But that's a common knowledge, right? And, and interestingly enough, around this time, uh, my, my colleague back then, Nicholas Zhe, the guy from, from Singapore, he said like, okay, MapReduce is cool, let's figure out two times 10 power 15 digits in a pi, pi constant, right? So it's a two quadrillion, the digits stay standing in the two quadrillions uh, place after, after the decimal point, right? So, and he ran this job, the MapReduce job, and he ran it for 23 days on 1,000 machines using some, you know, clever, clever math stuff. It turns out the number was zero, but it was a world record anyway. So what is not that common knowledge is that while he was developing the algorithm, there was a bug in the uh, micro, microprocessor or the whatever, the, the microcontroller for the, uh, the, the fan of, of the power supply unit in, the, in one of the racks. And running the very in compute intensive code caused about 500 nodes to actually literally pretty much like burst to flames, right? So the, 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 the whole rack overheated and they had to shut down like a part of the data center just to, you know, avoid the, the fire. So it was sort of funny. But 2011 was hot, right? So in 2009, I just mentioned that piece. Hadoop wasn't that, that actually powerful. Hadoop was sickly thin and looked like it was ill for, for, for 10 years, right? So this is actually original Hadoop, right? So I'm talking, of course, about that guy, not, 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 not myself. Look at these puny legs, right? And just, oh my God. <laughs> anyway. And turns out, actually, despite of these beefy racks and you know 4,000 nodes and stuff like that, turns out actually uh, size doesn't matter always, right? I mean, we wish, but it doesn't. So uh, a few years ago, a guy who was trying to learn how to do the map reduce and then learn the Hadoop technology, he grabbed a bunch of the chess uh, uh, chess games recordings, right? So like two terabytes or two and a half terabytes of the uh, two and a half gigabytes of the data. I'm sorry, not terabytes, um, and it was like. 40 years worth of chess games played by every single grassmaster and the, the chess master around the world, right? And he said, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll run some statistics and I will calculate how many, how many times black won, white won, and how many draws were there, right? So and he wrote this Java program and, 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 and it ran for 12 days on a three nodes cluster, right? Or 12 hours, sorry, 12 hours. And he said, no, 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 it's something wrong. So there's just <laughs> two and a half gigs of data. It couldn't be like that. So let me, let me actually do something about this. And through the number of the iterations, he actually developed the sequential algorithm that was running on his laptop, doing nothing but running a bunch of the um, uh, Unix power tools connected through the Unix pipes, right? So that's it. So it was like streaming job, no requirements for the memory because you, you, you shouldn't load a bunch of the data into the memory in order to process it. You were processing it as, as the data was going. So basically, he got rid of all this kind of multi-node stuff, distributed nonsense, and I'll show in a second how, how good he got. But basically, a multi-trading model and, and especially distributed model is actually sort of a hard thing, right? So it, it requires different paradigms. It requires different mindset. It requires sometimes different languages and frameworks. So in many cases, when you attempted to write a multi-threaded distributed code, think about this twice. So you might be much better off by just running this stuff on a single single CPU or something like that, right? But anyway, and this is this is what he 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 he, he has done, right? So that's effectively this is the code that processes the same amount of the data in, if I am not mistaken, 13 seconds. Okay, so the <laughs> 230 times performance improvement compared to Hadoop. And you can check this URL, it's actually a pretty good, good blog there, so the guy, the guy did a great job there. But anyway, MapReduce sucked. We just, we just witnessed that, right? So let's talk about HDFS. So HDFS is a distributed file system, right? So it has a central point that knows about every single block in a, f in a file system that's stored around the, the cluster or the data nodes, right? So clearly it runs the Java virtual machine, and in order to keep all this data in memory, it needs to have a large heap, right? So the consideration basically and the calculations from, from the uh, experience shows that for every petabyte of your storage, you need to have about one gig of memory, right? And, and, and there are some, some assumptions about the block sizes and the number of the blocks per file and whatever it is. But 
that means that effectively, if you want to have a cluster for uh, capable to, to store 60 petabytes of data, I don't know why I picked this number, honestly, but just, you know, looks, looks right to me. You have to have 2,500 nodes. Each one would hold 24 terabytes of, of, of storage, right? And you would have to have 60 gigabyte of uh, heap for name node Java virtual machine. Interestingly enough, because of the internal traffic and stuff like that, uh, the data nodes need to report the health of the blocks. They need to report, you know, how many blocks are written, created, deleted, changed, whatever it is, and send this block report uh, every so often back to the name node. And uh, in order to actually guarantee that name node does not lose the data nodes, they have to send the, the heartbeats, right? So on the cluster of that side, interestingly enough, the internal traffic, just to keep the HDFS alive, the internal traffic would take about 60% of the, of the resources, uh, computational resources of the name node. So basically, we see that <sighs> MapReduce blows, HDFS kind of sucks, Right, so what, what, what was left, right? So I mean, all the technologies are great. We've been promised the, 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 the great technology ever. We would be able to store and process, process the, the zillions of, of petabytes of data. Turns out actually technology is not that good, right? And it's not actually fault of the Java, right? So I mean, on the heap size of this size, uh, on the heap, um, uh, memory heap of this size, you would, you would have uh, garbage collection pauses, right? I mean, even if you use CMS collector, once in a while you still hit, you know, stop the world thing, right? And being a central node, being the name node that is only one for the whole cluster, you would actually have to wait until it comes back if you want to do something, something useful with, with your storage, right? So, but anyway. Um, and just the nail, one more nail in this coffin, right? So this is, this is an architecture that processes streaming and historical data in HDFS, right? So to, to, to tell you how, how easy to use this, right? So, there's a high latency layer, which is Hadoop. There's the speed layer for the stream data, which is like something like Apache Kafka, for instance, right? Then you have to have the reconciliation layer to put these discrepancies of the speed and, and, and uh, uh, accuracy of the data process in between the batch process and the stream process together. And then you, you uh, serve the data to, to the client. So a bunch of the motions. Um, a bunch of the uh, issues with data accuracy because this, the, there is a batch processing. Uh, operational complexity is crazy because there, there are two different clusters. You have two different frameworks. You have to train your development people to write into two different APIs and paradigms. So Hadoop is not easy, right? That's what I'm trying to say. So it's, it's, it's a one, one little nasty son of a bitch. So, but from that, where we are with the big data and the, and the adoption of the Java effectively, through the big data, uh, big data frameworks, right? So enterprises actually are not that very happy about the, the, the Hadoop, right? So they, they, they might skip it altogether because most of the enterprises do not process that much data, right? So 100 terabytes is roughly what, what the most of the operational sets is, and you don't need Hadoop to, this, to do this. Um, stream processing, close to real-time processing, fraud detection, uh, you know, predictive analytics, machine learning, right? So where Java, Java ecosystem is great again. Um, it, it's all not really fit well with the Hadoop ecosystem, right? So all app processing is not exactly the, the Hadoop thing. OLTP transactional processing is not. So, and, and HDFS by itself is not a cloud storage exactly, and everyone tries to move to the cloud because it's cheaper, because it's fancy, you know, because my, my neighbor is doing this and stuff like that. So where it leaves us? I think Hadoop is actually going into this kind of sunset now, right? So it, it, it's been around, it fertilized the soil, and it started moving elsewhere, right? So it, it, it's kind of gone. Um, but what's going on is, uh, and I mentioned this uh, little data, data greed thingy, Apache Ignite. What's going on is that instead of start inventing, reinventing the wheel and, and, and thinking of what we can do better, people started moving into in memory. So memory got way cheaper. So Networking got faster, uh, everything got better, and you actually, turns out, you actually can process the large amount of data in, in the cluster memory, right, without even, even hitting the disk. So who remembers this guy? Who recognizes this guy? No one? Employee number, fun, uh, number five of Sun Microsystem, John Gage. So he said, the network is the computer, right? It wasn't actually Scott McNeely who said this. This guy did, right? And then he was actually quite, quite an interesting persona. 
And uh, it turns out actually he was right. Eight, 19, 1994, the network is the computer. Just think about this, right? Nobody had even a gigabit fast Ethernet back then. We, in 84, like if you had 14.4 kilobits per second modem, you were like connected to the, to the parallel universe, right? So um, a little bit later, um, in other whatever, 10 years, a grid computing came, came about, right? So Sun bought this company called Grid Engine. By 2006, they had Sun Grid publicly available. That was actually first pass, even before the, the, the Amazon built their AWS thing. So, in 2003, literally, right, so 10 gigabit Ethernet came out. So you could have actually transferred the data on the wire faster than you could read it from the hard drive, right? So just think about this. Um, so, and speaking of the, of the transfer rates, right? So this guy on the back is the, is the spin hard drive, right? So the guy on the front, who is a little bit faster, <laughs> is your solid disk drive, right? Or solid state disk drive. And the guy on the speedboat is actually your memory. And actually, this picture doesn't even make the justice to the actual performance differences, right? Because memory is 2,500 faster than the, the solid state drive, and about 5,000 faster than the speed drive, speed, 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 uh, spin drive. So with the memory like that, with the prices of the memory coming down from 100 grand in 1995, who was born in 1995 here? Or who was born after 1995? Okay, well, so you don't even know what I'm talking about now. So, <laughs> so 100 grand in 95, down to $5 per gigabyte of memory, consumer grade memory in, in 2015. 20 years, 20,000 times price reduction, right? And now a little, little, little economical lesson for you. I can, I can move it back if you want to make a picture, sir. That's okay, huh? cool. Okay, so. A little economical lesson. So everyone says like an average inflation rate of 2% is good for the economy, right? So in 20 years, overall inflation would be 55%. That means that if you had 100 grands in 95, it would be the same as 155 grands in 2015, right? So if you take literally 60% of the inflation rate into the equation I just gave you in terms of the price of memory, the, the memory would cost like literally like half a buck or whatever it is, I don't know, so. Anyway, well, probably a little bit more. So all this combined effectively gave us the in-memory computing, right? So in-memory computing has been born. You could have used uh, computer memory as the primary storage. You, in many cases, wouldn't even need to hit the, the persistent storage, right? So you can process the memory, you can run it there and, and, and be happy. And non-volatile memory is actually coming about, right? It's great. Now you can even throw away your disks completely, and even if the power goes down, your data would not be lost from the memory because it got, got copied into the flash or whatever it is. So, and, and real quick, data fabrics, right? In memory stuff. So you get all these, all these components together, right? So little kind of puzzle. So you have Hadoop acceleration to hook up to the big data. You can actually slice and dice it in any way you want to. It depends on you know, what you're trying to achieve. But the Hadoop acceleration, for instance, you can hook up this Hive and MapReduce and stuff like this. By the way, MapReduce and memory MapReduce here would be about 35 times faster than the original MapReduce in Hadoop, right? And, and by the way, it's a, a fork join. It's not really MapReduce. It's fork join. It's, it's 35 times times faster, but it's still nothing close to 230 times performance improvements from the, from the streaming with power tools, right? So Unix rules, actually. So anyway, so you can do streaming. You can hook up all these components and stream the data and process it. You can do data grid. Uh, you can hook up SQL processing. You can hook up NoSQL databases to it. And uh, you can do data structure processing using third-party tools. You can do advanced clustering. You can deploy it anywhere you want to. So you got this little kind of edge hog picture, right, where in the middle is a new concept of the operating system we call in-memory operating system, effectively, which is hooking up every single piece of the infrastructure together. And what it gives you, the big memory architecture, right? So the IOT architecture, you have this in-memory fabric in the middle. You have a bunch of the data sources. You have event processing, the data coming in and out at the different speeds, right? And in the middle, you have this huge cluster that depends on what and how you need to process the data can do this 
either in a traditional fashion with MapReduce or fork join or whatever it is, or it can do this very fast, real, close to real time processing, in stream processing. And the, the great part of it is that behind that, there is sitting this in memory cache, the patchwork, where the data is actually split into data blocks. And instead of going and read it from the disk every time you need to, you can combine a bunch of the pointers to the data blocks and get yourself a data set that you can process right there in memory, right? So you don't need to hit this kind of serialization barrier, and, and, and you don't need to write the data and read it again. So it, it's super, super fast. So getting close to the end, hopefully you're still awake. Um, I wanted to talk about this interesting thing. So it's called pretense of knowledge. So where are we going with all this data collection? That's the most interesting part. Why the hell are we collecting all this data? What are we trying to do? I have a theory about this. So ever since people figured out that they can plan in advance, they wanted to plan in advance for good, right? So back in the, in the Soviet, Soviet Union, these people were sitting there collecting all these data building the grandiose five years long plans that would tell you how many stockings should be made, how many lipsticks of what shades should be made, and why the socks should be made instead of the Kalashnikovs or, or Lada, Lada cars, right? So they would know everything about you. You know, you, know, you know how it ended up, right? So we didn't have stockings, we didn't have lipsticks, we didn't have cars. We had a bunch of the Kalashnikovs though, right? So, but <laughs> this guy, uh, one of the brightest economical and historical minds of the 20th century, Frederick, Frederick Hayek, he said, I'd rather have incomplete but correct knowledge than pretend to have the knowledge about everything which would be false, right? So just think about this. You don't pretend to know. You'd rather understand that you don't understand something. There is unknown unknowns instead of being bold and saying, hey, I build a compute model, I have gazillions of the data points, and now I can tell you exactly what kind of underpants you have to buy tomorrow, right? Something like that. So what it, what it gives us. So here we're today, bunch of the frameworks to data collection, data processing, and then what's not. All these fancy things about natural language processing, how computers would think instead of us and tell us what to do. Um, and it's actually cool. So ambient, ambient artificial intelligence, which is not the artificial intelligence because it's not intelligent at all, helps us to do a bunch of the things, right? So our phones tell us how many steps we, we, we did today. Our thermostats are setting the, 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 the temperature inside of the room properly and stuff like that. So that's the state of the art today. We can recognize the cat from the dog just by running a computer algorithm, right? Oh, good. So I can recognize it actually any time of the day, but, you know. So... But where are we going? So I think where we're going is that clearly data processing, in-memory data processing will, will take over. So all these Sparks, Kafkas, and, and Scala by, by, the, by the extension will be, will be soon gone, will be history. And the world would be better, I think, without Scala, honestly. So <laughs> in-memory data grids would take over, right? Artificial intelligence. Would it happen? So generic artificial intelligence, I, I, I hate to break it for you. It's probably not going to happen. We're not going to have the sentient robots that would be running around, killing us all, drinking beer, stealing stuff. Ain't going to happen, right? Not going to happen. So what's going to happen? Instead, we're going to have what is called narrow or weak, weak artificial intelligence, which, which is effectively a bunch of the specific algorithms to help us to drive the cars if we were to drunk or something like that, right? Or to calculate, you know, how many bottles of water we, we need to buy in order to cover our, you know, thirst in the next month and stuff like this. So basically, IoT, Internet of Things, right? So connected phones, connected gadgets, what's not, would be a big thing. Uh, uh, consumer experience improvements would be a big, big, big thing. So basically, we will be collecting data. We won't achieve this ultimate feverish goal of the central planners where they could actually do everything for us and tell us what to do with our lives. But in the, in the process, we'll actually be able to solve a bunch of interesting problems, right? So, and these interesting problems are right there. Uh, and we actually, you, you look at the agenda of this conference, a bunch of these things is happening today, right? So machine learning and all this stuff. So where are we gonna be in 10 years? I don't know. Will we have 20, 20 million developers capable of writing super awesome Java code? I don't know. 
I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know if uh, Java would be the part of this future. I don't know if it would be able to run on the ARM architectures or be able to compute and process the amounts of data we, we need to process today. I don't ha have a crystal ball. I don't pretend to know, but I certainly hope it will. Thank you.